Hello, I'm Jamila Mustaifa, an international social etiquette consultant, author of etiquette books, and a mother of two. In today's video, I will do 20 facts about me, since I see that there are a lot of you that are new to my channel that have just recently joined, as well as a lot of you I notice are watching my videos that are not subscribed to my channel, and I urge you that you do, because uh, you subscribing to my channel helps me grow the community as well as helps me create more content for you. And uh, I share a lot of my life, so to speak, like my visual blog and diary on Instagram. If you're not following me on Instagram, make sure that you do, uh, because it's a little bit different from YouTube. I use it to stay in more closer touch with my followers and create a much uh, closer community over there. So uh, I will be looking at some of the notes here. That doesn't mean that I don't know anything about myself. It's just I want to follow uh, the step-by-step -step, uh, facts about me. Uh, so first things first is I was born and raised in Azerbaijan, Baku. I get a lot of questions. Are you from Uzbekistan? Are you from Kazakhstan? Where are you from? So I am from Azerbaijan. I've done a lot of different videos about my country as well as my culture, traditions like Azerbaijani breakfast etiquette, tea ceremony, I am from Azerbaijan edition. Um, so you can check out the playlist where I talk about my country. I love living in Azerbaijan, I love uh, our culture and traditions and I'm very proud of where I come from. So that is fact number one. Fact number two is uh, I graduated summa cum laude, which is the highest honor degree from George Washington University that's located in Washington, D.C. My major is in international relations uh, with a focus on Europe, and I actually minored in sociology and history. Uh, and then I did my master's degree in Belgium from College of Europe, Bruges. Um, and my master's is EU politics and administration. So my background, uh, educational background, is very much focused on international relations. Fact number three is I'm a polyglot, which means I speak a lot of different languages. Growing up in Azerbaijan, um, I was already from early age on, I was uh, speaking Azerbaijani and Russian. And then I started learning English and then Spanish, French, German. And then over time, I started learning Arabic. Some of the languages are now better off than others. And that's because I've been practicing them more. I've been more exposed to them. And uh, some languages still need a lot more polishing. I'm still working on it. It's constantly work in progress. Um, I actually shared recently a video where uh, I speak different languages to my kids. Um, going on to the fourth fact, I'm a mother of two and my kids are also polyglots and we did a video all together showing how we speak uh, different languages. If you haven't watched the video, make sure that you do. It's a lovely one. Next fact is I learned to bike quite late. I think I was 25 or so. I definitely had my first child and I had my daughter when I was 24. Uh, so I think it was when I was 25. Um, I really regret the fact that I never got exposed to uh, riding a bike as a kid because it's much easier to learn something when you're a kid. Um, but then going to Washington to do my undergraduate degree where, you know, uh, uh, college students would get together, do this evening bike tours around Washington, D.C. I wasn't able to join those because I couldn't bike. And then I went to do my master's in Bruges, which is a really small town in Belgium. And everyone was biking to class and I had to walk. And mind you, this is a very small touristy town and there aren't a lot of cars actually in a city. And if you wanted to order a cab, you had to call way in advance. And oftentimes I would find myself walking for 15, 20 minutes under pouring rain uh, to go from my dorm room to my master's classroom. So while everyone else we were riding a bike, I was uh, super jealous of those that could do it and so it was my mission to learn how to do it and I learned it when I was 25. I'm so happy that I did and uh, it did come with a lot of fear. I was always fearful of falling down um, but with the right mindset, with with motivation and with focus, you can actually learn it quite quickly. I think it took me about two, three days to be able to ride comfortably. And then uh, from then onwards, it was just constant practice. I remember um, once I learned how to do it, I went out on a boulevard here in Baku and started riding the bike. I still had a lot of fear inside. I couldn't maneuver the bike really well, but as I practiced, it got better. And now I'm pretty good at biking. So going on with this, actually, one of my life motos is it's never too too late or too early to learn anything so 
then having my kids I made sure that I taught them how to ride a bike from early on so both of my kids had bikes with four wheels and then gradually we took off the two other wheels so it was just two bigger wheels remaining and um, my daughter learned how to bike when she was I think four I just let her go and she just flowed with it and with my son I actually uh, taught him a, a month ago where he had a holiday vacation in school so I took that time uh, I took his bike and went out on the boulevard again and I just had this technique so he would bike and I would spread my legs around the bike and walk with him from time to time holding the wheel and then letting it go so he could feel the bike on his own and it took him about 15 minutes and he just learned it uh, it's just so easy for kids to learn anything uh, but it definitely takes a really someone to support you and someone to believe in you so you can learn it faster I have an older brother, his name is Jamil. Uh, it's funny because when we were kids, we once visited China and uh, my mom was always curious about learning cu about cultures and traditions and she asked our tour guide, um, can you tell us some interesting facts about the cultural facts about China? And the first thing he said, he said, um, you know, in China, we name our kids differently. So a boy gets a different name and a girl gets a different name. And we laughed so hard, I remember, because he thought that me and my brother have the same name. Technically, it's the same name. And Jamil means beautiful in Arabic. Uh, and Jamila is beautiful for a female. So it's basically an adjective for a man and for a woman. Um, so it has the same meaning, but it is different. But these are two different names. Um, I don't think we look much alike. I'll show a picture here. But um, a lot of people, when I was growing up, I was the ugly duckling and he was the handsome one. A lot of people just called me Jamid, but with long hair. Uh, so they said I looked very much like him with long hair. But I think as we grew up, we we start looking a little bit different. I think I take a lot after my father and he takes a lot after uh, our mother. But I was definitely the ugly one in the family up until a certain age. And he was always the more handsome one. I used to work as a teacher both in a private school here in Azerbaijan as well as an EU expert at Azerbaijan Diplomatic Academy. I was working part-time here and part-time there and I actually quit both of my jobs at the end, uh, mid of COVID and I realized it was very difficult for me to do so many hours of Zoom classes non-stop because for me it was very important to feel like, to feel connected to the students that I was teaching and at one point I realized I'm no longer professionally growing. Um, so if before standing in front of an auditorium, teaching them life, a huge uh, you know, amount of students was a big deal for me. It was a learning experience for me. At one point in my life, I got so used to it that I was no longer learning anything new in the process. And um, so the decision to quit was because I wasn't professionally growing and I needed new ventures and new things to try myself out at and really um, overcome my own fears and my own challenges. Um, so this was uh, a tremendous change in my life. And I think uh, COVID played a huge role in that shift uh, in my decision-making process. Um, and I also think that YouTube has tremendously helped me in becoming um, financially independent to be able uh, to pursue you know, the goal of just a, uh, a freelancer, I would say, a person who works on their own brand and on their own uh, projects. So thanks YouTube for that. I am a huge introvert uh, with ex with occasional extroversial adventures. I'm the kind of a person that I love being around people. I love talking and meeting new people. I'm very curious about learning about people and their especially culture, tradition, their thought process. I'm a curious person, but at the same time, when I spend a lot of time with around people, I definitely need a day or two by myself alone to just simply recover from the social social life that I've had. Um, so because now my profession is is very much involved with working with clients, with uh, students, um, so also being in front of a camera, I spend a lot of the time that I'm off camera just being by myself on my own, reading the things I want to read, working on the projects that I want to work, and I think the reason I have decided to focus on, on working on my own is because I think introverts thrive when they work on their own. So in a way, my character has also helped me with being able to manage this kind of work where I'm alone, doing my content writing, writing my books, working on my online courses. Um, so maybe some people might think that I'm very extroverted because of how I feel comfortable around people. 
but uh, I definitely am a huge introvert. I get asked a lot about my birth date, my ascendant sign, my sign. So I was born on July 19th, 1991. And that's why my favorite numbers are seven, nine, and one in that particular order. I think you might ask why seven? July is the seventh month and I just love anything that has those digits in it. So um, I believe in the triple seven, triple nine, those are my favorite numbers, triple one. Uh, I love my birth date. Uh, I love, I think, you know how you are sometimes born uh, on a certain date and how you maybe hate the month or you don't like the season. I would say I'm not a huge fan of summer as in general because I don't like to be under the sun. <laughs> I'm not a vampire, I just don't like to be under the sun. But uh, I love the month of July because I love celebrating my birthday. I was named after my father's mother, so my paternal grandmother. Her name was also Jamila. A lot of people ask me, do you know what your name means? And yes, I do. Uh, partly because I was learning Arabic, but also because I was always curious to know where my name comes from and what it does mean. Um, I love my name. I cannot imagine myself under any other name. I don't like when people nickname me, when people shorten my name or call me a different one, a different name, um, trying to sweet call me. I love when my name is fully, completely pronounced and it is Jamila. My favorite color, as those that have been following me on Instagram know, is black. I will always wear black whenever I'm in doubt of what color to choose. So black is definitely priority for me. And then anything that is of a shade of blue, so navy, light blue, you know, is turquoise, anything that has bluish color in it, I love. And I actually used to really like purple and burgundy. I still do love those colors, uh, but then again, it depends on, you know, on what it is. Um, um, and beige also, not beige, um, how do I call it? More like orangish brown is what I like. I like to buy mostly accessorize in that color rather than clothes. Uh, when it comes to clothes, I try to stick to black and navy. I am an intuitive eater, which means I eat things that my body craves. Um, and I have, well, been possibly trained like that from, from childhood of being exposed to homemade food and really um, trained my taste buds to like, so to speak, healthy food, homemade food, a lot of vegetables, um, a lot of grains. I love all kinds of grains. I am not a huge uh, sweet uh, person. I don't like a lot of sweets. I like certain ones uh, and I'm not really huge on foods either. I can have some, but it's not something that I would crave. And I do not snack pretty much, no snacking. Just eating the meal at the time when I'm, I have breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and then I rarely ever snack in between. So as I mentioned earlier in the beginning of this video, I'm a mother of two. Uh, I had my firstborn daughter uh, when I was 24, and I had my second child when I was 27. Um, when people ask me, do you think it's too early to have kids at that age or too late, depending upon your life goals and priorities as well as um, you know where you're from and you know what society has taught you uh, in a way so in my country in my culture 24 and 27 is the age everyone has kids if i were to compare myself with my friends from us i am you know a mother that had her children very early on uh, so it depends where in the world you are, really, and what your own professional or personal goals are. If you're someone who wants family and kids at a young age, I don't think there's anything that's too young or too late. You know, we get to decide uh, when we want kids. Personally, I've always been really into kids. I've loved kids. I think I always thought I'm, I wanted kids, but I didn't really think of marriage or having a husband. For me, kids were a thing I was obsessed with. I loved playing with kids of other friends and uh, of kids of our family friends. When I was, when I was very little, um, I think I had this like, this maternal instinct from a really young age on. But it would also be a lie not to say that I didn't have a postpartum depression after having my first uh, child. There's nothing that can prepare you to having a child. Um, you know, when I was younger and I played with someone else's kid, it was just for an hour. I played with them, had fun, and then left the child and left the room and I forgot about the child and everything that comes with taking care of that child. So I thought it was just the toy, you know, you played with. And then having the daughter and then quickly realizing that all my old life that I had, 
um, where I prioritize myself when I could take a shower for an hour, when I could just sleep whenever I wanted to, wake up whenever I wanted to, the next day my whole life just changed. And the priorities changed and my whole focus changed. At least for a whole year, it was very difficult to adapt to a new life. Um, and then as my child grew and she was about six, seven months old, um, her schedule became easier. She slept through the night. It became much easier and uh, I slowly grew into that role. But no matter how much I wanted kids, I wasn't ready to have them. And I don't think anyone is ever ready and fully understanding the amount of responsibility you have when you have a child. You just have to understand that you really have no vacations. There's no day off. It's not like a project or a deadline or, or a thing you have to do for university or your work. It, it never ends. There is no day off. There is no vacation. There is no like, I completed this, the next day it's done. It's an ongoing process and it teaches you every day to be patient, to be flexible and to be open-minded. I have agoraphobia, which means, if you don't know what it means, you can Google it, but it means the fear of crowd. Um, I, as a kid, I think it was, I was in seventh or eighth grade, I went to this concert of a very famous singer here in Azerbaijan. Um, he was a Turkish singer that came to visit and I remember how I got squeezed in between uh, the gates uh, when one part of the people were pushed backwards and the people from the back were going forwards and I was pushed between the two crowds and I felt this huge flow of fear and um, this tremendous amount of panic attack I never experienced before and ever since whenever I find myself in a place where I feel like I'm I can be crowd, crammed in a crowd when I feel like I cannot get out of the space um, I get this uh, fear um, I get this panic attack and it helps uh, to breathe and completely take my mind off when I start I try mentally to think of something else. It happens sometimes in planes uh, when I'm in a closed space and I realize that there's a lot of people on the plane, uh, which is probably why I try to stay away from uh, concert halls that involve a lot of crowd and the way you cannot sit, so it's all standing. I'm fine with talking, being on stage in front of a lot of people and giving a speech is because I'm away from the people. But if I'm put in the midst of that crowd, then I have a lot of amount of panic attack and anxiety. I am also an author of two books that I get to show it at every video. It starts with, hello, I'm Jamal Masaiva, I'm an author of books. Um, and you know, some people make fun of it and say, oh, you talk about your books at every single video, but again, these are my products, these are my kids. I have written them, I've developed them, I've worked with illustrators to, uh, to, to come up with illustration, to design the book. I'm very proud of what I've created and I can tell that um, these books really stand out from everything else available on etiquette in the market. So um, I cannot not mention the fact that I'm an author of two books because I take a lot of pride in the work that I've done and uh, I have created something that could be passed on generations and the knowledge could be shared with others. Uh, so I'm proud of them and by the way, if you don't have them, you can order them on my website and you can even get them autographed by me. My bucket list countries to visit are Latin America, um, Japan and Korea. I have had the opportunity and the blessing to be able to travel the world a lot with my parents. They really valued travel time more than anything else, so travel and education and uh, we've traveled to a lot of different countries with my parents and most of them were you know europe and north america and some of the asian countries as well we've been to china when i was younger um we've been to, uh, to malaysia I'm trying to think of uh, where else uh, we've been to thailand um, and there are some countries that i've never visited and i really truly want to uh, and so i hope that this year or maybe in the coming years i'll be able to uh, do some more meet and greets in, in the countries that I've listed and just over over the all over the world I hope that's the goal for for the coming years um, And the reason I would want to do Latin America is because you know, I love Latin American music I like the culture. I can speak Spanish. Uh, I like Colombian coffee. I want to see the Brazilian festival so I'm really into uh, into this vibrant culture of Latin America. I really want to visit Japan because 
their country really prides itself in the cultures and traditions and that's something I value a lot and I'm always curious to learn more about uh, and I definitely want to visit uh, Korea because um, lately I've been uh, following a lot of the Korean lifestyle bloggers on YouTube um, you know I find it very fascinating um, and I definitely want to visit my biggest professional dream they say don't share your dreams because they, people can steal that away from you but I'm saying it here on YouTube so this video stays here and hopefully when I'm able to do this, I'll be able to reference back this video and say, remember the time when I dreamt of doing it? Uh, now I'm able to do it. So my biggest professional dream is to do a documentary series, um, movie-like, uh, on etiquette around the world. I remember a few years back, I even um, started this kind of uh, this GoFundMe project where I asked people to help me get uh, funds to build this uh, documentary series and you know some people would comment like you know you can afford it to do on your own finances just do it on your own why are you asking money from us but really if you stand behind any movie production that is has ever been made I'm sure the actors that are playing in this movie could completely afford to film the movie on their own uh, but there are huge companies that are behind this movie production um, when you are in the movie business when you start learning about how to do documentary you realize how much money it all takes um, there's a whole crew of production post-production there's a whole amount of licensing to be to get and there's so much technology involved that needs to be either purchased or rented it's not a one man show if you want to produce something on a really good level even what i'm creating right now with youtube you know getting all this done uh, takes a lot of spendings and if i want to do it on a global scale where i travel the world meet people go to these restaurants uh, learn about culture and tradition from people uh, have this crew travel with me it takes a lot of budget and really it's a hugest biggest dream that i have and if anyone watching this also wants to contribute or you know become part of it if you can in any way get the production it i would be really happy and open to any negotiations and any collaborations um, because i think this is something that could really be entertaining but also educational and can stay there forever to educate um, you know the next generations about cultures traditions and learning about this will help the next generation be much more open-minded when you understand why these people are different from you and what makes these people different from you um, you go down to the root and traditions and society you start being more kind to each other and you start being more open-minded and I think we really need that in this today's world where people are very much uh, divided on it's either me or or you it's either this or that uh, so I think this movie is something that we could benefit a lot from next fact and I think this is something people ask me also a lot is what is your biggest regret uh, so I would say that the biggest regret is based on two things and that's probably because of the culture I was born into society is what other people might think and my inability to make decisions firmly I am very hesitant when I take a decision. It takes someone to persuade me to do it. And the second is I always think, what would they think if I do this? Again, maybe with, it comes with age, with experience. I realized that it is so important to be able to live your life based on your own decisions than what other people think. Uh, I read somewhere that, you know, we think people think about us, but in reality, everyone is busy thinking about themselves. So when you die, you realize no one really thought much about you. Everyone was busy living their own life. And I read a quote that said something like, I would rather live with regrets than what ifs, because what ifs are the biggest stealers of, of the present moment. Um, those that live with what ifs are never be are never able to fully enjoy the present moment because they're constantly thinking what if I did it differently and the people that do the craziest decisions ever and do not live they're the ones that never live with regrets and really are able to enjoy the present time so now arriving in my 30s I realized I would rather live with the regrets that perhaps you know last a week of discussion somewhere in a society rather than live with what ifs that linger for many many years in your mind my biggest personal dream not professional but personal would be uh, to be an owner 
uh, of an apartment, the one that I have purchased myself, the one that I've designed myself. And I just want to be a homeowner knowing that I've done it on my own with my own resources. Um, and uh, I would want to do it in a specific style. And, um, you know, I collect all these images and I visualize it all the time, how my apartment would feel and look like. And I am really working hard now towards that goal. And the final fact about me is if I weren't probably a YouTuber or um, a teacher, I would probably either be a dancer or an actress. I love dancing. I just get so excited from dancing. I love uh, performing and what you can tell by the YouTube videos that I'm doing. But um, the thing is, the stereotypical idea of me when they think of etiquette is that I'll, I'm probably listening to Mozart, Beethoven, I'm really into this classical music, which I truly love and I truly listen to and enjoy. But I really love dancing to reggaeton, I love dancing to hip hop, to Afro dance, to Arabic music, uh, belly dancing. So I'm really, I really like to shake it off with a dance. Um, so it's something I think that beats the stereotype of what an elegant or an etiquette consultant would look like. Uh, but again, I always say that I am not defined by one single adjective. I can be all these different kind of people in different kind of settings and have my hope is no matter what it's supposed to, you know, what person is supposed to have them or not. So I will dance uh, to reggaeton if I can and I enjoy it and uh, that's probably one of the biggest stereotypes people have of me. I hope that you enjoyed this video learning about me. If you have more questions, please ask me down in the comment section below and maybe I'll do another more, another edition of this video, more facts about me. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in my next one. Bye.